So let's move on to our next topic, talking about hybridization of data-driven and physics-based models for digital twins. And I'm really happy that the two of them are joining me right here on the huge stage in Stuttgart. Welcome, Andreas and Nicolas. Um, Nicolas Zimmermann is research fellow and project leader at Fraunhofer EAO and has experience for more than nine years. Furthermore, he is in charge of the Digital Engineering Lab, which is a demonstration center here in Stuttgart for research activities and demonstrators and coordinates the Innovation and Industry Network's Future Engineering Network and, do you say, KI or KI? It must be AI. I was really, yeah, yeah. Focus, uh, really confused on that. <laughs> KI in engineering. Yeah. So, much easier. Andreas Werner on the other side is a research fellow on the Institute of Human Factors and Technology Management at the University of Stuttgart in the team Digital Engineering. His research work particularly addresses the product and production engineering, specializing in the investigation of digital models and production systems. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Yeah. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, as you already mentioned, uh, we're both here today. So with me is my colleague Andreas Werner. I'm also happy to, hear, to be here. It's a pleasure for me. And now Nicola Zimmermann will do the introduction of our presentation. Yeah. So our topic today is the digital twin uh, of production systems. Let me give you a, a short overview of the agenda. So we're talking about the digital twin to increase productivity. Um, then we're looking at the analysis of uh, production systems, data-driven and physics-based modeling. Um, then we are coming to some use cases and also experience from our side and then a short summary and outlook. Um, our motivation uh, with the Digital Twin is, is as I said, um, increase productivity of manufacturing companies and therefore advance their competitiveness. Um, our approach for the Digital Twin is the analysis and optimization of production system. So we have a look at plant and equipment availability. We also have a, a look at uh, the service life of plants and equipment, um, the plant and equipment performance, of course, looking at some KPIs, we, the, the overall um, equipment effectiveness, and also looking at the product and process quality. Um, therefore, our technological basis for the Digital Twin is, from our point of view, um, uh, four, four things. So the digital model itself, which is about uh, the, the digital product uh, description, with the, which is machine readable. Um, then the digital master, where this model is then enhanced with uh, various information, like, for example, requirements, um, geometries and also structures. And uh, then we have also, as a part of the digital twin, the digital shadow, um, where the model is also enriched with um, operational data, which is then um, ex exchanged in a, in a bidirectional manner. And then we have um, the fourth part of it, of the digital twin, which is the digital thread, which uh, is the framework that interconnects all the information and uh, gives yeah, the, the thread, as the name already said. Yeah, <coughs> um, so we are talking today also of the digital twin as enabler for predictive maintenance. So just to give you a short overview, um, most of the companies out there should be in the range of um, preventive maintenance, at least from our experience. Um, and in contrast to reactive or preventive maintenance, predictive maintenance uses um, an estimation or algorithms to calculate the remaining useful life um, based on a comprehensive analysis of the production system to, to determine the appropriate point of time or the best point of time for maintenance. As you can imagine, um, when you have reactive maintenance, there's the biggest amount of waste because if you um, change, for example, the dye too early and you have, let's say, two weeks or three weeks of uh, remaining useful life wasted, that's really a huge waste. And uh, same problem is with preventive maintenance, where you have scheduled uh, time points for maintenance, where you can also have lots of waste. But uh, we have to say predictive maintenance is uh, very challenging, uh, also because of the multifaceted complexity of failure scenarios. So usually that's not an easy, easy um, thing to um, cope with here. Um, from our point of view, um, obstacles and therefore also need for actions we found when implementing the digital twin 
Um, and lo a lot of companies have inadequate IAOT infrastructure um, to make use of the digital twin and the data you have to collect. Um, then there's also difficulties in selecting an appropriate modeling and also um, appropriate algorithms. That's also because um, there's a huge complexity um, in the modeling and the simulation techniques behind it. <coughs> um, a, a most common problem is the lack of data. So, for example, um, training the models. So if you lack the data, of course, of breakdowns, for example, because you do preventive maintenance, then it's very hard um, to get out a model that um, predicts the remaining useful life here. And we uh, have also to cope with some losses in cross-system data exchange, for example, um, due to customer supplier relationships. Um, yeah, and therefore we have several points uh, that we here need uh, that we have a need for action here. So, for example, um, we have to develop an appropriate IoT architecture, as well as um, efficient approaches uh, for the data-driven modeling, and also for the physics-based modeling. But uh, we will see this hybridization um, is mentioned here in detail in the slides afterwards. And um, furthermore, we have to use a 3D ma master for applications with a strong visualization or orientation and which are close to production, for example, to make things also understandable here. And uh, also, as I said, we have to cope with um, some approaches for a loss-reduced cross-system data information exchange, which is uh, also very important for the models and all the data. Um, just a word to the data-driven modeling from my side, then my colleague Andreas will go on with the uh, physics-based modeling. Um, there are three steps of the data-driven modeling, which are the data collection, the data processing, and the data analysis. <coughs> so, for, uh, the data collection, that's all about um, selecting the right sensors, for example, if the machines al don't already have sensors, for example. Um, then, of course, the mechanical integration of the sensors. And also, uh, very important, the selection of the communication technology, so, for example, the bus systems. Um, considering the data processing, it's very um, important to determine the location of the data processing also determine um, the location of the information provision. Um, also selecting the right IoT gateways, for example. And if we take a look at the last step at the data analysis, um, it's very important to do the correct feature extraction. So this would be the condition indicators then. Um, and also use the correct fault detection, for example, um, which then leads to an estimation of the remaining useful life and here, of course, we are very dependent which data is available at the company and which sensors are integrated in the machines. And now I hand over to uh, my colleague Andreas, which will talk about the physics-based modeling. So our procedure for physics-based modeling also consists of three steps, starting with the understanding of the use case with a focus on the identification of critical parts of the production systems and the analysis of potential failure modes and effects based on a provided or um, developed FMEA. And the FMECA additionally analyzes the criticalities of the potential failure modes. Furthermore, you have to investigate the physical failure mechanism. And for the actual modeling, you start with the formulation of the model. This can be, let's say, paper-based without any specific so software support at this point. Um, just to get a first idea of the model, then you analyze all the system parameters and colli collect all available data and information about the production system. For example, material specifications or data sheets of different components of the production system. Then you do the actual creation of the model, and at this point, at the latest, you have to determine the modeling and simulation technique and the respective software you will be using. After the verification and validation process, you have to execute all the simulations via methodical design of experiments, for example. You visualize and interpret all the simulation results to derive first recommendations for an optimization of the quality of the analyzed parts. Now we have seen the procedures for data-driven and physics-based modeling, but how can we now combine the two approaches to compensate concept-specific limitations of the individual modeling approaches? So on the one hand, you, we use um, the, the physics-based simulation model has, has to be kept up to date. That means we integrate um, 
dynamic parameters from the data-driven model into the physics-based simulation model. And on the other hand, we use the physics-based simulation model to generate, to simulate additional data to expand the databases of the data-driven model. And there you have two possibilities. Either you are able to integrate virtual sensors into the simulation model, then the hybridization between the two models can be quite um, good, it works quite well, or if not, if you're not able to integrate virtual sensors into the simulation model, then to find correlations between the two models can be quite complex. Anyway, the output of the data-driven model, so mainly the remaining use for life of machine assets, is transferred to a decision support system, generating notifications to, for example, trigger maintenance actions on the shop floor or to give recommendations for an optimized machine or product development of the next generation. Let's now talk about some concrete use cases and experiences we gained in the context of research and implementation projects. So three pilot cases in terms of setbreak, a European Union-funded project about predictive maintenance, where we, together with 17 partners from nine European countries, developed concepts and solutions for data acquisition and processing, and in particular, uh, for the data analy an analysis, meaning the data-driven and physics-based modeling of various production systems. We used multiple algorithms and modeling techniques depending on the requirements and needs of the uh, respective use cases, and the overall objective of this project was to avoid breakdowns in production to, re to reduce costs and to increase the productivity. And the great thing about such a long-term research project is that you have the possibility to test, to validate, and to apply and even deploy the concepts and solutions together with industrial end users. In this project, for example, with Philips as a manufacturer of shaver cutters, Christamp producing um, chassis parts, and we had one pilot case where we had both the machine manufacturer, Sakmi, and the manufacturer of plastic closures, both from Italy, had on board. In the fourth use case, we supported an OEM by implementing a 3D master in a heterogeneous system landscape and they came to us and said, OK, in our company, the term digital twin is first set on hold. We have, first of all, to do some basic work on the digital twin, for example, specifying use cases. To, we need approaches for a cross-system data exchange to get a 3D master with external partners, in particular, the suppliers. Let's come back to one of the setbreak use cases about the continuous compression molding for the manufacturing of plastic closures where a filter clogging of a thermoregulator upstream the actual machine leads to a critical uh, pressure, volume, flow rate, and temperature behavior. I don't want to go too much into detail about the whole architecture, just saying that the acquired and processed data were analyzed by multiple machine learning algorithms to estimate the remaining useful life. We also applied an object and signal flow-oriented modeling approach with integrated virtual sensors in the simulation model for a multi-physics simulation of the mentioned thermoregulator. And the hybridization between the data-driven and the physics-based um, approaches was, carry out, was carried out by varying the mathematical function of filter clogging in the simulation model. We then automatically integrated the virtual sensors into the data-driven model, and at the same time, we always had a real-time integration of changing parameters during the production, during operation, in this, into the simulation model. What were the lessons learned in this pilot case? So, as mentioned, we had both the machine manufacturer, Sakmi, and the, and the process owner, the manufacturer of plastic closures, CDS, both from Italy on board, which was very supportive. And for the remodeling, I say re, since um, no simulation models were available at the beginning of the project, but for the remodeling of multi-physics systems, there's a huge number of good also open source software available. And from a strategical point of view, we can note that the machine manufacturer, Sakmi, sees itself as responsible for offering services such as predictive maintenance and the digital twin. Uh, last but not least, the project together with an OEM regarding the 3D master in a heterogeneous system landscape, how did we proceed with the project? We started first with a definition of information carriers, so the 3D master with the 3D shape, with the attributes, with the PMIs, then the meter and structure data set with um, meter information such as the creation date, but also the kinematics. We then defined use cases for the digital twin and did a process analysis of these use cases using a structured analysis and design technique. We then derived 
requirements out of the use cases um, for data formats which have to represent dimensioned information carriers. And in the end, we did a comparison between the a matching between the capacities of the data formats and the requirements out of the use cases to get specific data formats for specific um, use cases. OK, last but not least, we did a feasibility study where we designed the model of an exemplary assembly in three different CAD systems. We converted these models in four combinations of selected data formats and did a quality check. To sum it up, so from a mere technical perspective and within a homogeneous software or system landscape, we can say that digital twins already offer great potential. However, the experience we make is that there's still a lot of basic work necessar necessary, especially regarding the implementation of digital twins into industrial settings. And for that, structured conceptual guidelines and procedures are needed, as we've shown you on the slides before. And in addition to all the technical obstacles and challenges we're facing with the digital twin, also cultural and organizational aspects of companies must be taken into account. Yeah. Thank you, Andreas. And therefore, um, also, of course, you can uh, have a cooperation with Fraunhofer or the University of Stuttgart, um, mainly as a, as a long-term research project, for example, so public publicly funded research, for example, through um, the BMBF or the EC or the EU. And of course, you can also um, um, take contact with us uh, to search for direct solutions for concrete challenges and ob obstacles. So this would be then a direct commissioning, usually with, with Fraunhofer. And if you're not only searching for uh, technical solutions only, but also consideration, for example, of cultural aspects, and also searching for the exchange with other companies, you can be part of our uh, networks, which is the Future Engineering Network and uh, KI im Engineering Network, which is, yeah, a mixture between English and German here. And yeah, that's it from our side. And um, as we said, you can get in touch with us, um, contact us directly. We're happy to talk and discuss with you. And yeah, we're open for your questions now. Thank you very much. Andreas Nicolas, thank you very much for your presentation. And I received at least one question, but whenever I said that in the past hours, there were even more coming <laughs> in. So I stopped saying that. <laughs> so this question is, what different challenges are there for the digital twin of production systems compared to the digital twin for a product? OK. I, I can, I can you say can something start, yeah. that. Um, I think a production system is very complex. We have to combine very different domains, which Actually, we can say a production system is also a product, but some products um, are very simple, let's say it like that. So you're, they are not cy cyber physical systems, which means there is no sensor um, at the product at this point. So it makes it sometimes even more complex to get a digital twin of the product because you do not reach the digital shadow, we've heard, because no um, sensor is, for example, installed at a product. Yeah, And also, as Andrea said, it's, it's quite different. Um, comparing the use cases of it. So with a digital twin of a product, you have quite different use cases than you have with a product environment, for example. So um, therefore, you have to determine the requirements uh, beforehand, and then you can set up your digital twin. OK, wonderful. There's actually no more questions coming in. So thank you very much for the moment. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, if there are some more questions coming up in the next maybe weeks, you still have plenty of time till the end of June to ask questions to our speakers. But for the moment, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.